Welcome. This is Rick Durfee with Durfee Law Group, Estate Planning Law Group, and Probate Law Group. And we're excited today to be talking about family foundations. And I'm Michael Koberlein, also with Durfee Law Group, uh, associate attorney here. We got some good stuff for you today, talking about family foundations and uh, other ways that we can get involved in charitable giving. So a couple of things. Uh, a lot of people don't even know what the heck a family foundation is or how they work or why you would have one. They kind of seem like the province of the ultra rich, unless you're uh, the founder of a multi-billion dollar software company that you can go create a, an entity in your own name and give away charitable dollars. Uh, they think, oh, that, that doesn't apply to me. But one of the things that's happened, kind of like uh, 50 years ago to own a computer, you had to be pretty pretty rich. And today, everybody has computers and a lot of people have them in their pocket. Similar kind of thing has happened with family foundations and with charitable giving. Things that used to be really priced out of people's reach are now available. And there's some very fun and powerful things that we can do with them. With respect to that, so you have uh, some different vehicles that you can use to hold your charitable funds with. I know that uh, earlier you and I were talking about private foundations and also donor advised funds. Uh, some people refer to them as a DAF. Can you go into a little bit about uh, what a DAF is, what a private foundation is and who would use these and why? Yes. and. Let's talk kind of at a, on a fundamental level. If you're going to give something to charity, your favorite church or hospital or school or social cause, you can always just give them something directly. You can write a check and make a, make a gift. And in fact, a lot of charitable organizations, their entire budget is based upon that kind of direct ask. Hey, we're a good cause. Give us money. And, and whatever money they raise in the year, that's what they spend. Well, this whole, whole idea of having a foundation puts an intermediary between that end charitable user and the donor. And that intermediary is a way for the donor to have continued influence over what happens with the charitable gift, even after the charitable gift is made. And the historically, it is, it, it is true, in fact, that to create a quote unquote family foundation, you had to be in the Rockefeller class of wealth and you're going to go build a thousand libraries across the country. Uh, but uh, and the reason for that was to create that kind of a foundation, a private foundation. You have to form an entity. It's typically a corporation, but it, it can in some instances be a trust. Then you get that entity qualified on the federal level as a tax exempt qualified charity and you get it qualified on the local level, on the state level, in every state where you want to do your deal as, as a charity. And the issue with that, one of the big issues is the entry level is expensive. It's, it takes a lot of money and time and energy and expertise. So it priced people out of the market. The donor advised fund is an idea similar to a, a bank account. And this is an analogy or a metaphor if you needed a bank account and you're ultra rich, I guess you can go form a corporation, qualify it as a bank with the feds, qualify it as a bank in your state. And after spending enormous sums of money to do so, you have a bank and now you can have a bank account and you can write checks. On the other hand, there's a whole bunch of people that have already done that and there's banks on every corner. Go down to the favorite bank of, of your choice and walk in the front door and say, I would like to open up an account with you. And assuming you meet all their criteria, uh, you can open up an account at any bank and you put money in the bank account and now you have the full resources of the bank to, to write checks, to use credit cards, to get loans, to make payments, to finance uh, your house or your business or whatever. So in the same way with uh, charitable giving, because creating your own standalone independent uh, foundation is expensive and difficult, uh, about a century ago, frankly, uh, people come up with this really cool idea. And this started on a community level and local little foundations to encourage people to give locally. 
they would allow people to have a fund that they could brand with their name. And this fund would come under the umbrella of a public charity. And they would say, okay, uh, John and Mary Q donor here, you, you can call this the John and Mary donor uh, fund. And then you can give money to support whatever causes in our community. And then it's gone through several metamorphoses and you can find people that'll go through the history, but this kind of, uh, I started working with them, frankly, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. There were several organizations that offered these kind of uh, uh, accounts, charitable uh, account as an, a component fund of a bigger of a bigger charity. And then uh, something interesting happened. Uh, well, even, even before this interesting thing happened, one of the characteristics of this fund is you can put $100 in and you get a tax deduction for that $100 gift. It's a completed gift. You've given it to charity. It's not yours anymore. It belongs to charity. But but with this account, you can have that fund segregated. Your $100 is segregated from everybody else's $100. And it can be invested. And it can grow and do things. And then you can decide when and where I want to support this charity or that charity or I want to make a grant out to support some charitable cause. And early on, uh, on a small scale, Various uh, charities would allow the funds to be managed by outside money managers. And that suddenly became attractive to some very big players in the financial market. In fact, in the early 90s, uh, the 800-pound gorilla that decided to get on the elevator with everybody else was Fidelity. And so they started what was called, what is still called Fidelity Charitable and said, okay, we're going to allow people on our platform to create these funds and uh, contribute money to them, get an immediate income tax deduction, and then we'll manage the money, we'll manage the investments, and, and they can give money out to the charities. And the awesome thing that happened with this is suddenly donor advice funds exploded. They went all over the place and everybody started to have... Now, Fidelity claims that oh, they came up with the idea of, of having the institution manage the money, but actually it was not their idea. The people were doing it beforehand. And I was working with organizations uh, before Fidelity came around that were doing that. But now other financial institutions, uh, Schwab and Vanguard and others have jumped on the bandwagon with that. And frankly, a lot of community foundations uh, offer these donor advised funds. There's a lot of, uh, Churches, every brand name church, you, you name the church, you name the religious organization, somewhere there will be an affiliated donor advised fund with them. And even schools and hospitals uh, have, have jumped on this to have an advised fund. And each of them has their own issues. Uh, and in, in fact, you know, for example, if you pick your favorite church and you uh, give to the donor advised fund with that church, that church, rightfully so, is going to have some rules on what you can and can't do with the fund. They're going to say, well, you can support things that are aligned with our religious mission. You can support any one of these things that we're doing. So this mission fund or that service fund or this building fund or whatever the, the church has going on, you can support the programs of the church. And there will often be limitations on what you can do out, outside the reach of, of that church. And so churches or cause-related funds tend to be oriented towards their cause. Community foundations tend to be organized towards their local community. And the financial-driven organizations tend to be oriented towards we want the money under management. So there's a fourth group, I guess, of, of donor advised funds that I call independents. That they're not tied to a particular social cause. They're not tied to a particular social uh, a financial platform. They're not tied to any geography. So they can invest anywhere in the world on any lawful platform. They can uh, give charitable grants anywhere in the world to any charitable, uh, qualified charitable activity. And uh, and uh, so that they're not hampered in the same way. And among those, uh, we like several, but I will tell you my favorite is Legacy Global Foundation. And you can learn more about them at legacyglobal.org. They are independent and uh, and not not tied to anything. 
So the way it operates, you put your hundred dollars in, it can sit there and then next week, next month, next year, you can say, okay, well, I want to give $10 to this church or that school or hospital. Uh, you can have it earning interest. So it brings in an income and that income inc interest can go out. This can be uh, all used up in immediate grants or it can be operated like an endowment. And usually the cost of setting these up is fairly nominal. Uh, different platforms have different thresholds. Uh, the financial platform wants you to have so much on deposit before they'll do it. And even frankly, a lot of the churches and community foundations want you to have a minimum amount to deposit. It's another thing I like about legacy. They'll let you set one up empty. It can be a dry fund. It doesn't have anything today and it's not going to have anything until somebody dies or, or your, or your trust is administered or something like that. <laughs> so, so you've talked a lot about donor advised funds and lots of the flexibility. And as I understand what you're saying, uh, if you, if you go with one of these donor advised funds that's affiliated with a religious organization or with a financial institution or affiliated with, with some type of institution that they're always going to have some kind of a requirement, generally speaking, that will come back to them somehow. Whereas with an independent DAF or donor advised fund, they're not going to have any purse strings attached and you can kind of do what you want to do uh, within the same types of rules that are prescribed by donor advised funds. Yes. And so there's, there's obviously some laws and some regulations that govern what happens with donor advised funds and we have to follow those. But as an example, most of the financial platforms that, that offer these as part of their financial services will offer their donors, well, here's this group of six or seven or eight different funds, and you can uh, put your money in the donor advice fund. You can have it invested in any one of these funds, pick the one you want, and it'll be in, based upon your risk tolerance and your time horizon for using the money. But if you wanna have it independently managed by your outside advisor, uh, historically they've said, yeah, no way. Now, they're moving a little bit on this, partly because the independents, like Legacy, have been uh, making inroads in, because Legacy will say, yeah, we'll work with your outside financial advisor. Your, your money person, whoever that is, can, can manage this money. So, and you don't have to be on this one platform. You can be on any platform. Right. Uh, so we, and, and we talked a little bit about the donor advised fund being the fastest growing uh, fastest growing tool for lack of a better term of uh, where you can put your funds for charitable giving, but private foundations being the largest uh, in terms of the amount of assets that are being held by charitable funds. Uh, do you see that changing over time uh, to where there's so many DAFs that they outnumber the amount of private foundations that are being held. And, and if that, regardless of what happens there, if you're a person who wants either a DAF or a, a private foundation, what are the things that, that you would consider as to, you know, a DAF is a better fit as opposed to a, a private foundation is a better fit or vice versa. Right. So frankly, numerically, in terms of how many of which there are DAFs, the donor advice fund now outnumber private foundations. Uh, private foundations have the advantage of they've just been around longer. Uh, so, so they got a head start and more people set them up and they were often funded with large amounts of money. Uh, but the donor advice fund, instead of having to wait for your lawyer and your CPA to do a whole bunch of expensive work to create the foundation, you can create the donor advice fund in a matter of minutes, often by filling out an online form and click, 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 and send them a hundred bucks and you got one. So they're very fast to set up. Some other issues that uh, make the donor advised fund really, really popular. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention a few ease of setup as one. An another one, frankly, is the, is the cost of administration. With a private foundation, you have to do your own tax returns, you have to do your own accounting, you have to do your own compliance with the IRS uh, and 
and you have a number of constraints placed upon you. Uh, private foundations are compelled to give away 5% of their assets every year. And there's some qualifications and ways that that's managed. But bottom line is there a statutory uh, purpose for those is to uh, give away their money over a period of time and then be gone. So you're compelled to give away 5% of your assets every year. There are taxes on your portfolio earnings in a, in a private foundation and because you're a private foundation. And uh, then there are limits on how much you can have, how much you can deduct in terms of your gifts. When you make a gift to a private foundation, uh, you can deduct less on your tax returns than you can deduct if you make a gift to a public charity. And this is, this is an important nuance to point out. A lot of people don't know that in charities and tax exempt organizations, there's private charities and public charities. Now, what's the difference? Well, a private foundation or a private charity is one that's controlled, tightly controlled by a single individual or a couple or their family. And they have control, they have the board, they sign the checks, and they're, they're, most of the money comes from them. A public charity, on the other hand, is there's several tests, but in general, it's supported by the public. Lots of people give money to it. And the board is not controlled by one family. There's independent board people and, and the board changes from time to time. And so uh, with these, with public charitable status, some really cool, nice things happen. Number one, you get away from that 5% mandatory distribution because you don't have to be compelled to give the money away because public charities just give more money away than private foundations do. And they do it because they want to, not because they have to. You don't have the excise taxes on portfolio earnings uh, and you get the full availability of the tax deduction as much as, as there is. And uh, it's important to recognize that even with gift, gifts to public charities, the classic rule has been you can take the deduction, you can apply that deduction up to 50% of your adjusted gross income. That was recently bumped to 60%. And frankly, this year in 2020, for the gift to the right kind of charity, you can get deduct up to 100% of your adjusted gross income. With private foundations, that's limited to 30% or in some cases, 20% for highly appreciated assets and other things. So one of the things that happens with donor advised funds is that the sponsoring organization is almost always a public charity. So you get public charity status. So you get the full tax deduction instead of a limited tax deduction. You don't have income taxes on your portfolio earnings. So you can have your donor advice fund assets invested in portfolio assets and, and you get to grow them without having to pay a tax. Uh, with the donor advice fund, instead of you being totally responsible for all the accounting and all the tax reporting, those costs are shared by hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of other people. However many donors are in the donor advice fund, the parent or Custodial organization, they do all the heavy lifting on all the unpleasant stuff, the accounting and the tax reporting and the compliance. So for the donor, the donors then, what do they get to do? Well, they get to do the fun stuff. What's the fun stuff? The fun stuff is, on the one that's setting investment policy, well, we'd like to invest our funds like this, but the fun stuff is also selecting how the charitable funds are going to be used, you know, for what charitable purposes to what charitable organizations are going to get these funds. That's frankly the part that most donors who are involved in this, that's what they want to do. They endure the accounting and the tax reporting and their compliance because that's what they have to do to be able to get to do the fun stuff. But if they can do the fun stuff without worrying about the tedious uh, compliance things, then the donor advice becomes very attractive. So on average, the administrative overhead of a donor advice fund way smaller than most private foundations. Uh, it starts at about 1% and goes down from there. The bigger you get, the less it costs. So uh, that's, by the way, the envy of the charitable world. How many charities of any variety can claim that their administrative overhead is 1% or less? And the answer is hardly any. Uh, many, many charities out there and their administrative overhead is way more than so you can keep the cost down. Another huge factor, and this is one of the reasons why we're seeing a migration away from private foundations to the donor advised fund, 
and that's succession. Uh, in fact, I'm thinking, I have in my mind a, a good friend of mine, he's a doctor here locally, who has a, a pretty sizable private foundation, and he's done some tremendously good things, really wonderful things, and it's been great for him. But his children and his grandchildren don't share the same passion he did. He has. First of all, it wasn't their money that was put in there. It was grandpa's money. And second of all, they've grown up in a different world and, and they've had different life experiences. So he's very, very concerned about, well, who's going to take this thing over and run it when I'm gone? And with a private foundation, that, that becomes an issue. It's a real issue. In fact, there's some very famous private foundations that are now being run by the former maid of the wealthy family. <laughs> the, the, the wealthy family goes, yeah, well, we're all dead or gone or incompetent. And so who, who do I trust? Well, I trust my maid. So I'm going to turn it, turn it over to her and she can run it now. With a donor advice fund, you can define your charitable mission. You can define the charitable causes you want to support. You can define the criteria that you want used in how the money gets gets granted out to charities. And then the parent organization will do that for you. So there's a built-in succession plan to continue with uh, the charitable mission that you've envisioned and that you've started. And it doesn't depend upon you having a child in your family that happens to, to share your passion for whatever charitable giving you want. So if I'm a person who's choosing between a DAF and a, a private foundation, when, when is the private foundation a good fit? Because it sounds to me like a DAF is pretty, pretty much the, the choice unless there's something I'm missing. <laughs> so I have helped people create lots of both. I've done private foundations. We've done donor advice ones. In my opinion and my experience, for the private foundation to be worth it, the overhead, the administrative overhead, the compliance costs, the accounting issues, you should be prepared to put about at least $10 million in that private foundation. And that's, I've talked with lots of other professionals in the industry, and that's a pretty common threshold. Now, people do it with less. But again, uh, more often than not, that's not going to be a, just a grant-making organization. It's going to be an operating charity, and we can talk about the difference there a bit. But especially if all you're going to be doing is making grants to other charities, if you don't have $10 million, your overhead is going to be way, way out of line with the private foundation. So you can keep that overhead way down. It'll be significantly less than 1% with the DAF. And you can make grants to your charities to your heart's content, and it's quick and easy. And again, you get to do the, do the fun stuff. Now, if you have an operating charity, let's talk about what's the difference between an operating charity and a grant-making charity. A grant-making charity is one that gives grants to other charities. So it's going to give money to the schools and the hospitals and the churches and the and the feed the starving and cure the diseases and, and uh, build wells in developing countries and all those kind of things. An operating charity is going to actually run some kind of charitable operation. The soup kitchen, the used clothing store, the homeless shelter, the pet rescue. So if you're actually doing some charitable activity and function, then an operating charity makes sense. And, and you don't need $10 million. You need whatever budget is going to be required to conduct your operations. So very often, in fact, we, I just worked with somebody to create an animal shelter for a, a particular breed of dog, which was, was really kind of cool. And this organization is driven by really caring, wonderful people who are, are devoted to this particular uh, animal and its welfare. And, and so they're invested both emotionally and financially in the process. And they're not going to have millions and millions of dollars, but, and their overhead is going to stay small because they're simple but they're going to be able to conduct that charitable mission and, and operate as a charity. Uh, so that's another factor, $10 million if you're just making grants or you're going to be operating. And sometimes we can see those operating charities and a donor advice fund can have a, a, a partnership. And sometimes the operating charity, and this is one thing I try to get people to understand. Uh, if possible, in my opinion, you're, 
better off if you can qualify that operating charity as a public charity instead of a private foundation. Now, what do you give up? You're, you're going to give up some branding. Maybe it's not going to have your family name on it. Uh, you're going to give up some control. You're going to have to have a board with independent board members on it. Uh, and, and, and you're not just going to be able to put your deadbeat to spend thrift child on the, on the payroll, pay them to do nothing to run the charity. Uh, you, you actually have to function as a charity. So you're, you're going to give up a few things, but if you can get it qualified as a public charity, several things happen. You get all those tax advantages, the preferential treatment for deductions and avoidance of uh, uh, excise taxes on portfolio earnings, but also you then get the support of the public. You get other people that say, hey, that's a good cause. I like that one. I want to pitch in. Can I, can I give to your cause? So getting that public status, although some people uh, – are spooked by it. I think it's actually a, a good thing. Hmm. So let's talk about how these things work. How do you set them up to create a donor advice fund? As we mentioned, it's pretty straightforward. It's kind of like opening up a bank account. Usually it's a short application, a couple of pages, sometimes even one page. Uh, typically, you're going to name the foundation. Uh, you're going to name. Uh, you're going to identify what a succession plan. What do you want to have happen when you're gone? Do you want your kids to be able to take over? Do you want uh, the trustees your trust to take over? Do you want the trust to just? Do you want the fund to just keep doing whatever you told it to do during your lifetime? Typically, you're going to identify uh, your charitable mission or your charitable wishes. You can name. Uh, what's going to happen or who, what charities you want to support. And let me, let me use this as an example in estate planning because uh, we often have people come. In fact, I, I'm dealing with a case right now that the people had named several charities in their trust. These are the charities we want to support. And time passed and their family changed and their finances changed and those charities changed. And they've decided, you know what? That list of charities isn't our list anymore. We want to do new charities. Well, now that list of charities is on page 17 or whatever in the middle of a big, long trust. So to change the list of charities, we're amending the trust. And so they have to spend legal fees and, and there's other changes they're going to do. So it, it turned into a fairly complex and expensive process. On the other hand, if they had simply said... We're going to form a donor advice fund and we're going to designate our donor advice fund as the recipient of all of our charitable gifts. So whatever we're giving to charity, we're giving $10,000 to charity. We're giving $10 million to charity. We're giving 10% of our estate to charity, whatever it is that we're giving this property or that business or this thing to charity, whatever it is that they're going to give to charity, it all goes to the donor advice fund. And then at the donor advised fund level, without incurring any legal fees, without having to amend their will or their trust, without having to change any of the governing documents, they can go to the donor advice fund and say, you know what? That list of three charities that we had before, uh, that's not our list anymore. We want to add two more. We want to take this one off. We want to fine tune it. We want to adjust the percentages. They can do all that quickly and easily, often just online uh, in a few seconds of click, click, click. And so it, it gives the donor more direct ability to, uh, make their choices of what they want to support and do so in a manner that doesn't have to, they don't have to spend a bunch of legal things to make it happen. Hmm. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we talked about earlier was social capital and uh, family capital. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So this kind of links into why, why people create foundations like this. And there's several motivations. The first and the best, the one that I like the most, is that people are just generous and good and, and kind. They say, wow, I've the life's been good to me. Uh, I've prospered and thrived. I want to give back uh, to my world and my community, and I want to make things better for other people. So I'm going to give to money to charity. So let's set up a foundation and, and use that as a device to bless and help other people. So then there's that's I call it the intentional or the deliberate philanthropist. Then there's the reluctant or the accidental philanthropist. And this is how this happens. 
particularly in estates where, where people have been building and growing wealth. They have business interests, they have properties. One day they are confronted with an ugly reality. They own something and it could be a variety of things and it's not really theirs. They have temporary custody of it, but they're going to lose custody of it. And probably when they die, it's going to leave the family. Your kids aren't going to get it. And, and it's going to go one of two places. Yeah, this is your choice. You can either let the politicians have it and they're going to take it through taxation or you can give it to charity. That's it. And sometimes this doesn't happen at death. Sometimes this happens on a transition event, like selling a highly appreciated asset. And you and you come to realize, whoa, I didn't know I was giving a big chunk of that to the tax man. Uh -huh. Well, the politicians want their piece. And uh, and the piece they want, what's your guess? Are taxes going up or down? Are, is the piece that politicians want getting bigger or are they saying, let's shrink it? You know, which politicians are winning the day in the political battle? And my read is the politicians that want to tax more seem to be winning the day. So odds are a bigger chunk of what you have is at some point going to go to charity and or going to go to taxes unless you give it to charity. So very often in large estates, uh, people will designate whatever part of their estate is going to be lost to taxes anyway goes to their family foundation. So this is where the idea of social capital comes from. Family capital is the capital that the family gets. They, they get these investment accounts and these investment properties and the business assets and the homes and the cars or whatever. That's going to be for the family. And the family can use those and can uh, take income from them and can uh, uh, enjoy them for their own benefit. The social capital is money that the family doesn't get. It's going to go to somebody else. And the question is, who's going to decide who the somebody else is? Do you want to let the politicians make that decision? And they're happy to do so, but quite eager to do so. And that's what happens when when you uh, pay the taxes. You know, they take the money. Now, now it's not yours anymore. It belongs to whatever taxing authority happened to uh, collect that particular tax. And then uh, uh, the politicians choose how to spend the money. Well, if it goes to your family foundation, who gets to make that choice? You do. You do. That's kind of cool. So you can say, well, yeah, the politicians might have their agenda of what they want to support, but this is my agenda. I want to support whatever's important to you. Your church, your community, the schools in your neighborhood, uh, the, the hungry people on your streets, the place where your family came from, uh, the people in the developing country that you speak their language, whatever it is, you can pick your social causes and you can support those things. So uh, this is kind of that, who, who do you want to be making the choices, you or someone else? Who do you trust to make good choices, you or the politicians? And uh, regardless of what your political affiliation is, uh, people of any political affiliation, I trust people to make good decisions with their own money more than someone else. So uh, that the, the family foundation becomes a very attractive vehicle in that estate planning. So, and so a family, for example, in a, in a, it, this doesn't have to be a super wealthy family. Let's just, let's pick a modest amount. And today, believe it or not, to have a million dollars is pretty modest. You can have a million dollars and be broke. If, if you've worked for 30 years and paid off your house and you own a car and have a little bit of money in your uh, our retirement accounts, and and you you've got a few savings here and there, and and, uh, and you've got some furniture in your house. You can have a million dollars, and if you lost your job or or had a medical crisis, you could lose it all in a heartbeat. So let's just say you have a million dollars. Let's just say that you're generous and you want to tithe, and you want to tithe when you die. So when you die, you say, okay, of my million dollars. 10% is going to go to my family foundation to support social causes, my charities and the things I believe in. And the other 90%, 900 grand, that's going to go to my kids, my grandkids, and they can do their thing with it. So now your family has this $100,000 in the family foundation, and that's a resource. It's social capital. They can't buy a boat or take a vacation with it. They can't put their kids on the payroll with it. 
They don't, they don't get to use it as a down payment on their house, none of that. But they can say, well, there are social causes in our neighborhood, in our community that need help. Here's the local school, the, the marching band needs tubas, or here's a local homeless shelter and, and uh, the people there, I can see them and I want to help them. Uh, or the church or the hospital that they uh, support, whatever, they can, they can support their charitable causes and they can use that $100,000 as an endowment. So it's invested. By the way, they can use their money manager to, to manage that money and they can draw the income off of that and every year give out grants to support those causes uh, that they like. So that's kind of the uh, family capital versus social capital issue. And here's, I, I want to give you an example. Uh, some years ago, I was at a seminar with, the room had a couple of hundred lawyers and CPAs in it, and, and they had a, a famous economist. I wish I could remember his name, but I can't. And uh, someone asked this econ economist at the end of his presentation in the Q&A part, uh, what's your opinion about the, the uh, national debt? Are you concerned about that? It's kind of a policy question. And to the surprise of the audience, this economist said, oh, I'm not concerned about that at all. That's a complete fiction. It's totally an illusion. Now, you can agree or disagree with what this guy said, but I'm just going to report to you what he said. This, of course, uh, drew some shock, uh, some gasps from the audience of lawyers and CPAs. What, what do you mean the national debt is not a fiction? It's, it's pretty real. We really owe that money. He goes, no, 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 because the federal government has this enormous amount of off-balance sheet assets, which that drew, again, puzzling looks and questions. So he said, let me explain. And he had the numbers. I don't have the numbers. He said, but there's this much money in retirement accounts. And he listed them off, IRAs and 401ks and 403Bs and pension plans and on and on and on. He listed them all off. He said, there's this much money in it. And this is what we know. And he had a percentage. My recollection, it was not quite 50, just below 50, 48% or something like that. He said, net, 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 when everything is done, Roughly half of all that money belongs to the federal government. And, and the federal government is just waiting to collect it until a taxable event happens. You die. You take the money out for retirement. You try to give it to your kids. Uh, ah, we get half, the politicians say. Yay, yippee ki -yay. And he said, if you, if you factor in all of those off-balance sheet assets, the federal debt zeroes out and goes away. Now, Again, I don't know if that math still works. That's That was a couple of decades ago when I heard that, that talk. He also made another interesting point, though. He said one of the best things about this structure, he says it's very clever. He said because people think this money is their own, they will do their best to protect it and take care of it and grow it as big as possible. So the government doesn't have to worry about that. They, they know, oh, these people with these retirement accounts. They're doing their best to make that retirement account as big as possible. And that's fabulous because we're going to get our share when, it, when they try to take the money out of the retirement account. So what we encounter today, and this is actually a pretty a surprisingly common situation. Uh, it, it always surprises me, at least every time I hear about it or see it. We see a lot of people with overfunded retirement accounts. And what does that mean? What's an overfunded retirement account? Uh, retirement accounts... All the statutory retirement accounts that you read about or hear about or that you have, they have a, a legislative, a statutory purpose. And that purpose is to pay for what? Your retirement. That's their purpose. And as it turns out, the statutory purpose is the most tax efficient use of those retirement accounts. And in fact, if you try to employ those retirement accounts for some use other than their statutory purpose, they become very tax inefficient. So these big, we have people with IRAs, for example, with lots of money, more money than they will ever, ever possibly need in their retirement. And in fact, they're angry. I have people say, I'm so mad. I, I had a birthday and now they're requiring me to take distributions out of my IRA and I don't want to take them. I'll, I'll say, why don't you want to take it? They say two reasons. Number one, I don't need the money. Number two, I have to pay taxes on it. And number three, that's my kid's money. Now, number one is true, you don't need it. They don't need it because they have other, other sources of income or their house is paid for and they're not spending that much. Number two, 
Uh, yeah, yeah, you have to pay taxes on it. But the three, it's my kids' money. That is a delusion. Once again, that money belongs half to the government. So what can you do? Uh, by the way, those retirement accounts are a great vehicle to make gifts to charity. There's some limitations on what you can do with donor advice funds while you're alive. But often uh, people that have those bloated, overfunded retirement accounts, we can do some very fun estate planning. There are, we can create some tax-free alternatives that will create an equivalent amount of tax-free cash for the children. We can re keep enough money to completely pay for the retirement no matter what, they'll have enough money. And everything that would be lost to taxes when they die, that can go where? The family foundation. So now what is the family? And by the way, that can go, how, how would you like to be able to get money out of your IRA with zero taxes? Zero taxes, no income tax, no estate tax. Well, if it comes out, goes to your family foundation when you die, that comes out and there's zero taxes. No income tax, no estate tax. So a lot of times people that have wealthy physicians or entrepreneurs or others that have accumulated large amounts of money in their retirement accounts uh, will, will employ them in that manner. And we, we get a, a, a win across the board. Kids get tax-free money because of the planning we've done. Mommy and daddy have the retirement paid for. And the money that was going to go to the politicians now stays within the influence of the family. The family can use that as social capital support charitable causes and, and uh, social things that the family believes in instead of turning that control over to the uh, politicians. You, uh, you mentioned uh, why, why it is that we, that we set up donor advised funds or why it is that we do private family foundations. And we talked about social capital and family capital and uh, char charitable intent, tax incentives, uh, one of the things that I read about recently, and I don't know how common it is, but uh, we see it with with people like uh, Rockefeller and Kellogg and Ford. They still have these foundations that are around, and they've been gone for several years. Um, but there's this idea uh, of a psychological um, motivation to set up a family foundation. And they, the author that I was reading referred to it as terror management theory. And the, uh, the sense of this is that there's a, a defense uh, mechanism internally for us where we want to be immortal somehow. We want to stick around for generations beyond our own mortality. And so we create these symbols that we can leave behind where we have a name on a bench or we have a name on our foundation or we have some kind of impact in, in our uh, story that can live on for, for generations even after we pass on. I'm curious to know if, if that's something that you've seen or people have, have uh, mentioned to you in, in your practice as a, another reason as to why they would want to do this kind of planning. Yeah, it is. It's interesting. There's some warring, con conflicting concerns, and I I find this very fascinating. On the one, there there are some people. You bet they want to see their name on the building or on the bench. Uh, that's very important to them. They'll they'll name the foundation after themselves, and they're very motivated by that. They want to be invited to the to the shindig where the muckety mucks all get together and get pitched for uh, get, give money to this cause or that cause. And, and, and that's a social thing. They get a lot of accolades from peers and others. Uh, there's a certain amount of status that goes with that. So there are people who thrive on that. On the other hand, there's a lot of people who buy into the idea that if I'm going to give to charity, I don't want anybody to know about it. Yeah. And, and I see several things. This is a, a, a great way, actually, the donor advice funds are used. If you want to use it to brand uh, all your charitable giving after you, you can. Go for it. But I have a lot of my clients, especially high net worth clients, that they don't want to be known. So I, I, I'll give you an example. I had a client who sold a big business, made a lot of money, wanted to tithe to a church. And, and so he, he structured it. So a big chunk of the sale went through his donor advice fund and ultimately went to his church. And 
his church, of course, was curious. Hey, where'd this money come from? Because the client was very, very deliberate. Yeah, don't tell him it's me. I don't want him to know it's me. And so, because I was the lawyer, I kind of ended up in the middle of this conversation. The church came after me and said, hey, we tell us who your client is. And I said, yeah, my client doesn't want me to tell you who, the, who my client is. And they said, well, we can get him tickets to these sporting events and we can invite him to these dinners and there's all these events where we're, we'll, we'll invite him to. And so I said, you know what, let, let me I'll float that by my client and see what my client says. So I took that to my client. He says, so let me get this straight. He says, I get free tickets. In fact, really good tickets to the ball game. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, who's going to be sitting next to me at the ball game? And I said, yeah, there's going to be somebody sitting right next to you. And the conversation is going to go like this. Thank you for what you gave us. What are you going to give us now? <laughs> he said, yeah, that's exactly what I don't want. So he declined. He said, I can buy my own tickets to the stupid ball game if I want to go to the ball game. So uh, when you go to the hospital or the church and you see the little bricks on the wall or the leaves on the tree or whatever they've got, here's what you can look for. You will see, you go on there and you'll look and you'll see the, the so-and-so family foundation and it will name their family. Or it will say this person's name. And then you keep looking and you'll see a whole bunch of leaves on that tree or bricks on that sidewalk and it'll say, Anonymous. Anonymous. So that's another thing the donor advice fund can do. It can keep you anonymous. It can protect you from the solicitations. If you get on a mailing list, oh, you gave money to this charity. Somehow those, your information gets shared and now you get hit up and you get sob stories. I've had clients that have won lotteries and they, if their name gets out there, everybody comes, oh, you won the lottery. I need $10,000 to save my sick relative from some horrible medical condition. And if you don't give it to me, you're a nasty, ugly monster. So yeah. you can avoid all that kind of stuff uh, by doing your charitable giving in a manner that, uh, you know, what does the Bible say? So that your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing. Uh, and, and you can have it either way, whichever way drives you, mm -hmm. uh, it, it works. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. You can, you know, whether you're, you're going to be known in public for giving or, or not is, is a personal choice. And uh, whether you do it one way or the other, often people are going to have something that they want to pass on to the next generation. And oftentimes that can be values and that can be uh, a culture of charitable giving. But in order to do that, uh, as I see it, there's a certain amount of training that needs to take place in order for the next generation to really uh, buy in to the charitable, charitable giving culture. Can you speak to that uh, in, in terms of the training, the next generation? Yeah, absolutely. And I want to, I want to kind of tie that to the, are we going to be uh, known for our charitable giving? Because uh, something I'm going to mention here is having in a family What's the, what is the impact and the effect of having a culture of charitable giving as a family that, that does something? And this is a culture that can be adopted as a business. And so we see a lot of businesses, for example, will establish the equivalent of a donor advice fund and white label it branded in the name of the business. So you can have the checkout point. Would you like to round up to you know give your change to this branded charity in the name of whatever business you happen to be? Uh, shopping at to support whatever cause they happen to be supporting. And on the one hand, yeah, that's kind of a marketing thing. It builds goodwill for the business, but it also in fact, that money. So in a family though, uh, we observe something and something we deal with in with estate planning, with families that have wealth, we get to watch and see what the wealth does to people. And often we think, oh, having wealth would be really fantastic. I, I could quit my job and I could buy all these toys and I could do all these fun things. Well, sometimes wealth can be, uh, it's like running water. It, it, it can water your garden or it can wash it away. It can be a very uh, uh, productive force or a very destructive force. And we see families that have, they get a little bit of money or a lot of money and it, and it messes them up. It turns their kids into dirty, rotten, good-for-nothing, spoiled, brat, trust babies. There's a reason why, why. Why is being a trust baby a bad thing? It's because they don't turn out good people. 
Uh, on the other hand, we see families that have wealth, sometimes enormous amounts of wealth, that consistently turn out highly productive, powerful, effective people. They make great neighbors, wonderful members of our community. We hope that our children find and marry somebody like that. So what's the difference? Why do some families have really good experience with money and others have a really bad experience with money? And, and we certainly don't know all the answers, but we've observed some things. And here's one thing I've observed professionally over the years in working with a lot of families. Every single family without question in my personal experience that has a happy, positive, healthy relationship with wealth has a culture of charitable giving in the family. They give to charity as a family. They donate their time and give, and give money and time and resources to charity and not just singly, but they do it as a family together. So I, I have a, I want to tell a story. And this is a, a really a true story, although it's an amalgamation of more than one individual and the details and the facts are changed to protect the privacy of my class. So I was invited to a family meeting with a client from a significant estate some time ago. And at this family meeting, a 10-year-old girl was giving a presentation to grandma and grandpa and the aunts and uncles about my charity. And she had one of those trifold science fair project cardboard things that had pictures of her charity and all the all the good things that her charity was doing. And she was pitching the family to approve a grant to her charity. And this was happening because in her family, they had some social capital. They had a foundation. It had money in it, money that was going to get taken away taxes, but they'd captured those tax dollars and had them in the family. And now they're, okay, we're going to do some good with this stuff. And part of what they did is they gave family members a, a budget and said, you can, you can give away X, come to the family and let's approve that. So a 10 year old girl was pitching the family to approve the charity that she had picked. And they, they interrogated her. They asked her lots of questions. Well, what about this? What about that? How's it going to work? What are they going to do with the money? How are you going to know if they succeeded? How are you going to know if it did any good? What impact is this going to have on the world? And she, she was ready. She had answers for all those questions. Then the adults spoke for a few minutes and, and, and then grandma came and said, okay, sweetie, uh, we're going to approve your grant to your charity. And then grandma said something that at the time I'd never heard this. I've heard it many times since, but at the time it really blew me away. She said, we want you to know that in our family, we don't send the check. We deliver the check. She said, we're going to approve this grant to your charity on the condition that you volunteer in the charity and you work in charity as a volunteer for the coming year. She did. Now a year passes. And this now 11 year old girl is presenting again to the family with her same trifold uh, presentation on a cardboard back. Uh, but now it's the after pictures. And she had pictures of all the things that the charity had done with her gift and with her volunteer time and the good that had happened. And uh, that had a profound effect on that girl. It actually had a profound effect on me as a human being. So I want you to know the reality now. This young woman is now in her mid-30s, is a mom. She drives a seven-year-old car. She lives in a modest home in a modest neighborhood. And you would have no clue that she sits on an empire worth hundreds of millions would not even know. And she does a tremendous amount of good in the world. She does not live uh, flamboyantly. She's not an, a, a, a conspicuous consumer. She never shows up in, in public without her underwear. She's, she's a responsible, decent human being. And I believe that a major factor that went into helping her become what she has become was the fact that from an early age, as part of her family culture, she learned that the wealth she had as part of her family was for purposes of making the world around her a better place and not just for purposes of giving her a fabulous lifestyle. So we try to look, you know, what I do professionally, what Mike and I do professionally is we, we help families plan their estates. And these family foundations are one of the tools that we use. And so a, a huge factor is how are we going to use this foundation or can we use this foundation even to train, prepare, uh, help, uh, the next generation gain the skills that they need. So, uh, and I'll give you another example. I actually have had clients to say, okay, here's the family foundation. Here's this fund within, within our family foundation. We're going to, we're going to give you X number of dollars and you work with the financial advisors. You define an investment policy. 
you help decide what to invest in and what not to invest in and when to buy and when to sell and all that kind of stuff. So this young person is learning how to make uh, pretty sophisticated financial decisions and they're doing so with money that ultimately isn't theirs. So they can grow it. And then, and then when they get to give it away to charity, they, they get that satisfaction. I, I've seen, by the way, the reluctant philanthropist, like the person who comes to giving to charity, not because they want it. No, I hate that. I don't want to do that. The only reason I'm doing that is because I'd rather give it to charity than give it to the politicians. I've seen those people, by the way, after the first time that they see what happens when their charitable gift makes a difference in someone's life or in the, or in the health of a, of an honorable and good organization that's out there making the world a better place. It, it has a profound impact on people. Now I, I want to mention uh, a couple of things that can also be done with these as we're kind of approaching the end of our time here. Uh, these family foundations are also a very uh, powerful environment for making what's what are now called impact investments. People have come to realize that how they invest their money makes a difference in the world. So for families that are concerned about making investments that uh, don't support blood diamonds out of Africa or habit forming uh, pharmaceuticals or whatever, that want to invest in a socially conscious way, the Family Foundation is a great uh, vehicle for doing that. You get tax deductions on the way in. You can grow the money. Uh, you're more concerned about doing good than getting a, a huge return on your investment. And whatever re return on investment you do get, then you can you can use to as social capital to, to further the good you do in the world. Uh, these kind of family foundations are often a tool that are used in conjunction with other things like uh, charitable remainder trust, split interest gift, charitable gift annuities. Uh, they're they're usually a component in an overall plan. They rarely happen in isolation. They're, they're part of a big picture and a very important part. So you, we've talked a lot about the impact that charitable giving has on the family. And by the way, I've, I've heard that story before and I really, that, that just the, hearing the story impacts me in terms of what I want to do in my own family with respect to creating a culture of charitable giving and how that can impact generations. Uh, so I appreciate that story. I'm sure whoever hears it appreciates that because it's a great story and a true story. Um, in addition to how charitable giving can impact our families. You mentioned a little bit about CRTs and uh, split interest gifts. Are there other uh, financial services and products that that uh, would be impacted by the things that we've talked about? Yeah, I want to give a pitch out there to the financial advisors, the money managers, and, and point out something that, that maybe they don't realize, or if they do realize, they, they feel powerless to do anything about. Some, and I've actually had this scenario that I'm about to describe happen many, many times. The financial advisor realizes, wow, I have this client with significant resources. They have no children or they've, they're have they estranged from their children. They're not going to leave money to children in any event. And, and they're going to give their money to charity. And they're very generous, good people. But when they die and when that gift goes to charity, I'm going to lose this account. It's going to be gone. I don't get to manage that money anymore. And on the one hand, I'm thankful that I got to manage it while I did. And I'm grateful that my client's being generous and good. But that kind of stinks that I had this nice account and now I don't. Well, if we can do this planning in advance while the client is still alive, obviously, and instead of giving the funds directly to the charity, set it up in a family foundation, which will function like an endowment. So the funds are invested and the financial advisor gets to manage those investments and keep doing so even after the client dies. And then the income is drawn from those, and those income. That income then is made as grants out to the charities. So the charities, the end user charities still get the money. Sometimes end user charities have been hostile to donor advised funds because they see them as competitors. Oh, if you got the money, we didn't get the money. Well, cool your jets and be patient. And be nice and polite, because if you're nice and polite, the person who would have given you the money 
up, all up front will give you the money eventually over time. So be nice. So the donor sets up this endowment fund. The financial advisor continues to manage it after, after the donors passed away. And the end user charities get gifts of income over time. Now, here's something to consider because I've seen this. If you give a gift to charity once, they're going to say thank you. What are they going to say next year? They're going to say, who are you? And what have you given me lately? You set up an endowment where every year in your name, if that's what you want, or anonymously, if that's what you want, every year in memory of, they get another gift, another gift, another gift. They will be thankful every year. Also, you can hold them accountable for what they're doing. And I, I, I have to tell this story. This is a powerful story. So some years ago, I had a client pass away. She left a sizable amount of money in a donor advice fund to support a particular social cause. And I, I'm just going to try and keep this as neutral as I can because I don't, I think I would have listeners on multiple sides of this issue. So her, the money was going to support a particular social cause. After she died, the organization, the specific organization that she was supporting was taken over by a for-profit enterprise. And the for-profit enterprise introduced practices which were exactly the opposite of what this woman wanted to support. And her children, who by the way had advisory rights for this fund, were horrified. They said if mom knew that her charitable money was doing exactly the opposite of what she wanted to do, she would be doing backflips in her grave. This is terrible. What can we do? And the custodial organization with the donor advice fund said, well, you have advisory rights. Advise us. What would you like? So the children were able to go find another organization that was in keeping with their family's charitable and, and, and personal values and say, well, we would like the funds, instead of going to that organization that's no longer doing what we agree with, we would instead like it to go over to this organization that's doing uh, things that we agree with. And that's what happened. So this creates a vehicle by which you can hold the, the charities that you support accountable to their original mission. Charities encounter, by the way, something called mission drift. And in fact, if you read uh, Gandhi's autobiography, which is a book I love, I've read several times, he talks in there about the dangers of, of endowed charitable causes because they get taken over by people who are hostile to uh, the particular cause. And he, and he used some examples in India of charities that were set up to support one group of people and then were taken over by the enemies of that group of people and were used to kill that group of people. And uh, I've had similar stories of people in other places, even in the US. Uh, this charity was set up to support this particular cause and it's been taken over by the enemies of that cause and it's now used to destroy that cause. So the donor advice fund again can be used as a vehicle that the family can hold charities accountable to uh, their particular mission. And, and by the way, if you're an advisor out there uh, and you think, well, I might have uh, clients that might benefit by this, uh, I encourage you, or if you're a donor either way, I encourage you to get in contact with Legacy Global Foundation, legacyglobal.org. Uh, they're not affiliated with the law firm. They're a separate nonprofit entity. We like them. For some of the reasons I said at the beginning, they're independent. Uh, they are not tied to any particular financial platform. They're not tied to any cause. They're not tied to any country. They can give to any lawful charitable cause anywhere in the world. They can invest in any lawful platform. They can work with any, any qualified advisors. So get a hold of Legacy. Call them up and ask them questions. If you have estate planning and you are thinking, well, I already have some charitable giving in there, or I, I want to have charitable giving in there, get with an advisor, us or someone like us, that is familiar with these tools, that can help you know what your choices are and help you implement your choices in a way that will get the job done in the most tax efficient and cost effective way. Uh, this is a heck of a lot of fun. Michael, I'm, I'm running out of things to say unless you have more questions. 
No, I, I'm with you. I think we've reached that magic hour where uh, it's time to say goodbye. But I uh, do want to thank you for all the things that you enlightened us on and, and the information. Uh, as I mentioned before, the charitable giving part of this is the part where I think it it becomes very, uh, very influential, uh, especially, you know, I have several children, as do you, and, and we want to make sure that we, we create strong family relationships, and we want to make sure that we create generations that continue on in that way. And in hearing about this charitable giving, the story you tell, and just recognizing the importance of, of having uh, uh, fondness or, or a, a charitable disposition, I think is it, it well I know it's important and it's it's something that can be beneficial for for each of us to think about to consider to see how we can maybe do a little bit better in our lives and also to help our clients to recognize how it can can benefit them and their families and uh, the other thing that I would I would just mention too is uh, again reiterate the the benefit of uh, donor advice fund and how how financial advisors out there uh, who talk about these things with their clients, you know, it's not something that's going to take away from uh, what you do. In fact, uh, in my opinion, it's a win-win. You, it's another tool in your toolbox where if you want to talk about a donor advice fund, it's going to be something that you can still take advantage of as a professional and feel good about it because. You're helping people, and you're also going to have the opportunity, if your client so chooses, to continue to manage those assets that go into the donor advice fund. So one last thing I want to mention, and this is another reason why I love the donor advice fund, it, it democratizes philanthropy. You don't have to be ultra wealthy. You can set one up with, with nominal amounts, a few hundred dollars, 20 bucks if you want to. Uh, so whatever your charitable budget is, whatever your capacity is, give. If, if you can do something to make the world a better place, give something. If you, if you are frustrated with things happening in the world that you don't like and you want to make them better, give. If, if you feel like there's injustice in the world, give. If you feel like there's people that are worse off than you, no matter where you are in, in the spectrum, give and make somebody else better. Lift somebody else up and you will find yourself lifted up as a result. And the Donor Advice Fund makes that possible on the smallest scale and on the most gigantic scale. So that's it for today. It's been a pleasure to be with you. We hope you've learned something. Uh, feel free to give us a holler. We'd love to help you design or plan anything around this. Uh, give Legacy Global a, a call and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.